morning, Mr. President. Hello, Arthur. How are you? Oh, I'm tired this morning. This rat race down here is going to go on forever, I'm afraid. <laughs> you got a nice little cubby hole for me to crawl in. Yeah, uh, sure I have. just about had it down here. <laughs> My high hopes for this organization. I thought you were an anti-UN man. Uh, that I was the U.N. man, but my uh, high hopes are becoming very, very dashed. Well, I I, uh, I hope I didn't run over you much yesterday. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I want to say something to you about that. You made exactly the right decision, but I wanted you to have all of the relevant facts. Yeah. And I feel that, uh, that you were under any pressure from me. <clears throat> uh, I concur in what your decision was. Uh, the way I put it to uh, McBundy was that you had to balance the international complications with our domestic and other requirements, and uh, I was quite satisfied with that decision. I want well, you to know that. They told me it was all 51-49 against me, and I said, well, I'll just, I said, I'll make mine 52-48. <laughs> you know, uh, you, know, I, I, uh, you know, I uh, carefully... I carefully took all the boys here for the lowest political officer. And I said, you're under no restraints because of me or because of anybody else. And uh, you go ahead and express yourself. Everybody expressed themselves, you see, and, which I encouraged. <clears throat> and then I, uh, I told Mac what the report was. But uh, just between the two of us, had I been in your place, I would have made exactly the same decision. I wanted you to know that. Well, thank you. You're mighty fine. I thought there's two things. I thought, first of all, we'd already made that decision yes, once. Yes, and we would have been inconsistent. And the second thing is, I think if you're going to try to get somebody to do something, yeah. that then use any influence with them, as we're going to have to down the road uh, yeah. with counseling of these people, we better not join with all their enemies and repudiate yeah. them in public and well, denounce them exactly. around. Yeah, you did exactly the right thing. And it, you, you, no sweat in, as far as I was concerned, frankly. But well, I was you, afraid you and Rusk and yeah. Bundy said he came out 51-49 against <laughs> it. I said, well, we'll just make ours 52-48. <laughs> well, it just illustrates the old Truman uh, doctrine, you know, that the buck uh, passing stops here. I was eating lunch with a bunch of businessmen, about 20 businessmen on the tax bill. Uh -huh. That's something I want to talk to you about that sure as hell does worry me. All of our economists in the government say we're going to have a hell of a big spurt this next, this last half. Uh -huh. But they missed the first half. Uh -huh. Now, every businessman I talked to, I started out yesterday with DuPont, and I went right down the list. Every businessman you asked to steal all of my table. They say their orders, all their barometers, all their indicators do not show anything but a sluggish second half. Now, I said, if you come in and throw a tax bill onto it, God knows what happened. Yet we've got a $25 billion deficit. You've got to have a, you have to have a tax bill, Mr. President. Uh, it looks you like cannot, uh, You cannot be the president that uh, saddles, the, you know, builds up this time. The war is going on. You remember back uh, in the early days of the Kennedy administration when he had to step up the military budget? Yeah. You remember I advocated the tax increase then? I was Heller and everybody was against it. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I still am of the same mind. Uh, I think when the country is at war and we're at war, that it can absorb another bill, and you will not dampen the business activity, because after all, this additional expenditure is pumping a lot of money into the economy. And uh, businessmen are always pessimistic. <laughs> if you listen to their advice all the time, I think that's right. right. They're always preaching gloom, and they don't have the orders, but the country's rolling around in great shape, and... Uh, you have to watch for the total interest of the country, and I don't think you can, in good conscience, come out with a deficit of that type. What's happening in Newark, isn't that hell? Pardon? What's happening in Newark, New Jersey, isn't that hell? That's the most terrible thing. I got sick to the stomach when I saw those pictures last night. Did you see television last night? No. no. Oh, I tell you, that's going to be distributed around the world, and... Uh, it, it was, I'm glad the governor stepped in because the local people didn't know how to handle 
The police were, the scenes were, the, the outbreak was terrible. The scenes of what happened, the police didn't handle it right until the governor moved in. It was one hell of a mess. Mm. Are you going to send a personal representative to cooperate with the governor? No, uh, the attorney general says that we've got uh, two people up there with the, uh, from the community relations service who are the best people in bringing these uh, groups together, kind of mediators. He says that for the president to get into it, Hughes called me yesterday and I told oh, him... Oh, did the I, governor call you? Yeah, I told yeah, him I was I'd gonna give him full support. Him. I told him I'd give him help and support and let me know what he needed to do. But then the attorney general called him and said it better for the president to stay farther away from it. He said the funny thing, there's a psychology in these riots among these people that are full of dope and all worked up and martyrs anyway. Sure. That if the president says he'll cooperate or he will support them or he will consider any requests they have to make, they immediately get the word started that the president is going to intervene and, and go after it. us, take after us. And they have a great, they build up a great imagination in their own minds that uh, the big power, the big white man on top of the hill is coming after them. Sure. He said he found that out in Selma, Alabama, and also found it out in Watts. So he says for me to stay, I did talk to Hughes and told him to go ahead and we'd help him any way he wanted to, anything we had. Shouldn't and then I told him... be known? Yeah, he did. Oh, in the good, paper this good. morning. Well, that's the main thing, to show yeah. concern. Yeah. And then it's up to the governor. And uh, I think, of course, the hell of it is, I'll tell you, he's arrested for 500 and he's going to start indicting them all and trying them Monday. It's a hell of a mess. I don't know what's going to happen. It's a hell of a mess. You know, uh, they say they got reports it's going to spread in other cities, New other Jersey. Cities. They say they're just a bunch of local gangsters that started. Well, it doesn't take much, you know, when there are discontents to fan the fires. And uh, that's one of the reasons sometimes I feel that with all the frustrations that these little countries down here, we have to be understanding of their problems. Sure do, sure do, and I think you do a wonderful job of it. You're more patient than I could be. Oh. I just can't, uh, uh, I just uh, don't see how you're as patient as you are and as I, understanding as you are, but to, you've got that kind of philosophy and you were born for it and you grew up in it, so you got to help those who can't help themselves. That's the main thing. I want to give you a little rundown about the scenario down here. Good. Uh, we're through with this thing. Uh, I know it's going to happen, and that's why your abstention decision was a wise one. Uh, in about three or four days, the Russians are going to come in with a complaint to the Security Council to invoke economic or possibly military sanctions against Israel because they won't rescind this legislation, and we'll just have to stand up against it. Uh, in the meantime, we're trying to get this assembly over. Uh, the Russians are desperate to pull something out, anything out. Now, I have told them we don't want to rub their noses in the dirt, but we're not going to abandon the basic principles that that you have stood for. You saw my conversation with yeah. Dobrina. Yeah. Uh, there was a word yesterday through the secretariat that uh, they wanted to talk to me. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't call me directly. I don't go running after them, you know. Yeah. I don't believe that's dignified. Yeah. But if they want to talk to me now about uh, winding this up with, uh, uh, not on their terms, but by a simple statement referring it back to the Security Council, I'm agreeable. And that they never should have started this business. You know, it, I don't know whether you've seen the debates down here the last week. But it's been terrible. It's been a religious debate. And you know the, you know you're a historian, you know that the religious wars in history have been the worst war. When you appeal to men's religious uh, instincts, you're reaching pretty down to the raw fiber of the man. So that uh, I'm going to work desperately to get this show, that's all it is over here, now wound up. Uh, by, by Monday or Tuesday in the assembly. Mm. Uh, then uh, they're going to uh, 
probably make this move in the Security Council. And the only sensible procedure, which we can't get them to follow, I told this to Dobrynin, and even suggested a man that they have good regard for. That's and that on is, the mediator. Pardon? On the mediator, the yeah, Swiss. Yeah, that's Yaring of Sweden, who's, there, who's Sweden's ambassador to Moscow. He said they have high regard for him, and our people have high regard for him. The best thing in the world would be to send a mediator out there and try to start getting these people into some peace, peaceful arrangements throughout the whole area. But uh, I still don't know that the Russians uh, want to do anything but uh, keep the pot boiling. Frank. They want to keep things in firm, man, and they want to fish in troubled waters. They want to uh, finally get a dominant position in that part of the world. Yeah. Next time you talk to your congressional leadership, uh, worried about your sending a few little airplanes to the Congo, which I approved of, and which was pursuant to UN resolutions, you might mention to them you have not heard them voice any protest about the Soviets practicing gunboat diplomacy and sending a battle fleet to uh, Egypt, right in the midst of this. If you sent the Sixth Fleet to Tel Aviv right now, or Haifa, there'd be one hell of an outcry. <laughs> I have not seen any reaction to this from some of your friends on the Hill. That's right. And I'd like to see a speech made by Bill Fulbright and a few others, uh, Gene McCarthy, Ernest Greening, protesting Soviet gunboat diplomacy in the Middle East. <laughs> You have to talk to him. You know what happened, though, don't you, when the hotline was going? Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, he sent me this mean message yeah. that said that they'd already made the decision to involve the military. Yeah. And it was very serious. And uh, uh, then we replied to him. He told us we had to get Israel to stop ceasefire immediately. Yeah. We couldn't do it. Well, they ought, we ought to be on notice that they'd already made the decision, and it involved the military. Right. Did you see that message? I didn't see that. Well, that's just the toughest thing that's ever gone on between Russia and the United States in the history of the United States. It was the meanest one, and it was the hottest one. I don't guess but three or four know it. And you know what happened? We started to reply, and we all sitting there in the room, and... I said, well, I want to ask him what in the hell he's done to stop the Syrians. Right. And so I took a yellow tablet and wrote out, and Rusk said, well, could you, uh, we're taking immediate steps to uh, ask Israeli to abide the ceasefire. Could you give me a report? Could you report to me that you have uh, successfully done likewise with Syria? Mm -hmm. And so I turned to McNamara and said, how many ships do we have out there? And he said, well, you got two carriers, and you got about six destroyers, and you got a few auxiliary ships. And I said, how far are they? He said, they're about 300 and some odd miles. And I said, how fast they travel? He said, about 25 knots. I said, well, where would they be in 24 hours? And he said, well, if you let them go normal speed, didn't slow them down, they'd be up there 80, 90 miles off the coast of Israel. And I said, well, just turn them off. Let's reply to this message now. Just tell the Joint Chiefs to turn them and east and go right in that direction. Mm -hmm. So 24 hours later, they were 90 miles off the coast there. And the message came through that it's all over. They, <laughs> they changed their mind. Oh, yeah, they came right back with the message. I don't know whether they ever saw them or whatever, but I imagine they knew it they were 24 hours. Of course, anything they ever mentioned by it, it would look like a threat and it looked like a big uh, swashbuck in Texas uh, blowing around, and we never did say a word about it, but I thought that's what uh, I told uh, uh, my wife. I thought 
that's what changed the thing more than anything else. When I turned those two carriers with hundred odd planes on them and just shoved them right up their ass when they sent me wires, right? They'd already made a decision. It's military. I didn't say I didn't say a word. I just uh, said you try to get Syria to close down. But I, like did old Roosevelt, I just said soft force. But I turned them around and moved well, them right up there close to them, and they understood that. That's damn good. That's exactly. <laughs>